And please stand with me as we read. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another within psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Please be seated. Verse 18 is our main verse. Uh, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with uh, the Spirit. There are two commands here. Don't get drunk. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Um, and we clarified all of the parsing and the grammar. Uh, you should literally translate that as, as be being kept filled. That's the literal raw translation of the grammar. Be is the command. Being, okay, that's the continual present tense aspect of it. Uh, kept filled is the passive tense. So I think it's like uh, present, imperative, passive, um uh, uh, not active uh, parsing. So it's be being kept filled. It, it basically means always be led by the Spirit of God. Always yield yourself and submit to the Spirit of God. Now, last week we pointed out that it's very, very significant that being filled is connected with being drunk, okay, or not being drunk. Of all the examples that Paul could have used, he puts the filling of the Spirit of God and the idea of getting drunk with wine on the same verse. And so it is not just be filled with Jesus Christ and His Spirit and now with you know video games or puzzles or whatever your hobby is. It's be filled and not be drunk with wine. And so it is a clear indication that this is about alcohol. And we took some time to understand what Paul was saying. Now, it's clear that the injunction is not about getting drunk. I mean, it's about not getting drunk. It, it, there's no actual, actual prohibition here. It, it, Paul's not saying you know, abstain from ever drinking. And, but people use this verse in the wrong way. They're saying, hey, look at it this. As long as I don't get drunk, I can still what? drink um and so rather than taking the time to wisely and humbly seek out the whole of scripture with regards to the subject of drinking they push their desire to drink and latch on to this one verse claiming that the bible does not forbid drinking now, even if they would like to use that argument and state that this verse does not specifically and literally state that one cannot drink they're failing to see the main point. Okay, Even if it does not spe specifically prohibit alcohol, it commands that all believers be under the control of the Holy Spirit. So those who are pushing drinking, okay, I know they're saying, except getting drunk, okay, they don't seem to care about the submission part. Does that make sense? They're so caught up with the drinking aspect that it doesn't forbid drinking. They're not talking about the main point of, but we have to submit to the what? The Holy Spirit. And they're unwilling, in one sense, this is the impression I'm getting, that they're unwilling to give up drinking in order to fall in line with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's very clear. We are to be controlled by the Spirit of God, not by alcohol. And if you put yourself in the shoes of these Ephesians, these Ephesians who read this and heard this from the pulpit from Timothy, they knew from their own personal experience what happened in the temple of Diana. Okay, It was one of the Greek temples and they worshipped Diana. It was a place where they got drunk and committed all kinds of sin. So if you're an Ephesian and you heard Paul says, don't get drunk with wine, 
but be filled with the Spirit. They knew exactly what Paul was saying. Meaning, they knew it's not an issue of, that I, can I drink or can I not what? Can I not drink? They're not going to take this verse and say, Aha! Paul did not say, don't drink. It just says, don't get what? Drunk. They're not going to do that, obviously. Because they know what's associated with drinking and drunkenness. To them, it was a sensitive issue. And they could hear Paul warning them, don't go near that. So even if Paul said, don't ever drink, they knew they had to be hyper careful. Some of them were saved out of this temple lifestyle and they would not ever want to touch that ever again because it reminded them of that, the, the addiction of wanting to go into that kind of sin. So again, they knew it's not an issue about abstinence. They never asked the question about abstinence. They understood what Paul was saying. That they need to live a lifestyle of being under the submission of the Holy Spirit. Now, so, do not use Ephesians 5.18 to say we can drink. I don't think that's intended here. But granted, granted, I'll give them, I'll, I'll, I'll let them have it. Okay, you're right. It does not state clearly not to drink. But what about other passages? We went to Romans 14 last week. <clears throat> Turn with me to Romans 14, verse 13. We went through basically almost the whole chapter, verse by verse, um, and it became clear that Paul would never say drinking was a sin. He never would say alcohol is a sin. He would always say that everything God created is what? It's good. Yet at the very same time, he would never promote it. He would even say, if I could, and if I had to, I will be abstinent for the rest of my life. Look at verse 13. It says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather judge this, not to put a stumbling block or offense before a fellow brother. I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is defiled in itself, but to him who considers anything to be defiled, to him it is defiled. For if because of food your brother is grieved, you are no, lo no longer walking according to love, do not destroy with your food your brother for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be slandered. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is pleasing to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue the things which make for peace, not drinking or eating meat, sacrifice to idols. Pursue things that make peace in the church and building up of one another. By the way, the word pursue there is the word for persecute, dioko in the Greek, which means chase after that guy to kill him. That's what persecution is. And Paul is using that word to say, chase down the things in the church that will bring peace in the what? Church. Do whatever it takes to bring peace and unity and the building up of the body of Christ. So verse 20, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of, and just fill in the blank, Food, meat, drinking, alcohol, whatever. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. So it is not good. So, it, I'm sorry, verse 21. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine. And that basically means if you have to, abstain. Or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Okay, So it's pretty obvious Drinking itself is not sin. Can a Christian drink? Yes. Should a Christian be more careful about it? And maybe even come to the point of saying, I will never touch what? Alcohol. Now, as I told you before, and you'll see this as we go on in, in this text, okay? The, uh, to be an elder or deacon in this church, you have to commit yourself to a lifetime of abstinence. Kombucha as well. No, I'm just kidding. There's a whole thing about is kombucha alcoholic. 
I mean, it warns if you let it ferment long enough, it will actually become alcoholic. If you see, if you see uh, the documentaries about kombucha companies, their biggest thing is how do we keep from being what fermented to become alcoholic? Like it's very difficult. So a lot of kombucha companies went out of business and one particular one kept on going, but it took a lot of money. They actually had to apply for an alcoholic license to keep their business open. Now, I'm not here to talk about kombucha, whether you should eat or not, but I'm just saying, if you're going to be a elder or deacon, you, you have to be careful, just completely abstain from alcohol. But we're not going to mandate this to the church because it, the Bible obviously doesn't mandate this. This is more of an application of being a leader. Now, with all that said, there's one more principle we need to look at before we jump into another text. Look at verse 7. Romans 14, verse 7. This is the principle. Okay, the principle is not, should I drink or uh, can I drink or not drink or should I drink or not drink? That's not even the main principle. The foundational element in your heart is this very thing. Look at verse 7. For not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And for to, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might, be both, he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Do you guys understand what Paul is saying? He's saying the issue is not what you want. A Christian is one who no longer lives for himself, he lives under a master. Who is that master? Jesus Christ. He's saying once you forget that, you will start arguing what you want to do and what you don't want to do. He's saying if you live, you don't live for yourself. If you die, you don't even die to yourself. You're always accountable to who? To a higher master. And look at chapter 15, verse 1 through 7. Chapter 15, 1 through 7. It says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his building up. Now I sent this verse out on Signal this week and I made it clear to all of you this word neighbor is not the one living next to you. He can be an unbeliever. The neighbor here is referring to a fellow believer in the church. How do we know that? Well, if you read the rest of the text, it's clear that it's talking about your fellow brother. But look at the, look at the command. You are not to please yourself. Do you guys understand what this means? It means what it says. Don't please yourself. Let me give an example. Okay? Dads. You come home from work, you had a busy day, you're tired, you want to please yourself, you want your wife to serve you, you want your kids to be quiet, because this is now daddy's quiet time. That's pleasing yourself. Each of us is not to please our own self. It says, verse 2, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his building up. Look at the emphasis. Do what helps them. Do what helps them. Do what helps them, not helps you. You know, we always say, oh, but uh, if I, I just need this time alone, it'll really help me. Honey, get those kids in the room. Leave. Go, out, go, go to Costco or something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend some time. To recuperate, it's good for me. The Bible never says, take some time off and do good to yourself. Look at verse 3. For even Christ did not what? Please himself. For, um, for it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. What is it saying? He came on. He came to earth 
so that He will work the work of God and die on the cross for our sin. He was never here for Himself. From the moment He was conceived in the, in the womb of Mary, He was working. Can you imagine that? Never had a time alone, except when He would pray at night. And he would have to pray all night. And he could even sleep sometimes. And then the very morning, instead of telling the Lord, Oh, why don't you, guess, why don't you take a nap? You stayed up all night and prayed. They would bother him and say, So-and-so needs help. So-and-so needs help. And so he would just fall asleep at just odd times of the day. You guys know that, right? When they're on the boat to cross the, Gal the Sea of Galilee, he just fell asleep. As a human being, he just couldn't handle it. He was never there to please himself. Look, if you drive into the driveway and you're ready to go and serve your family and you just clock out, that's okay. That's what the Lord did. But she never came in through that door and demanded that he be served because he's the dad. Mothers, please, right? Honey, take, my, take the kids. All you did was work all day. I had to deal with these monsters all day. Let me have some time alone with my phone. On Instagram. Okay, and all night they would they would glory in that time alone. Those of you who are single, it's like an all-day event. You work for yourself, you eat for yourself, you you do things for yourself. You're just literally practicing pleasing yourself. By the way, here's an advice. Uh, those of you who are single. When you're done with work, call someone and say, hey, can I minister to you? Can I serve you? Can I take you out to dinner? At least once or twice a week. Don't go home and say, oh, now is my time. Turn on that computer and start playing games or whatnot. Guys, stop that. You're developing a habit of pleasing yourself. See, if you go on, this is why it says in verse... Um, uh, verse, uh, verse, verse 5. Now may the God of perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you notice that the, the word oneness keeps coming out? When you stop pleasing yourself, the church becomes one. It's when you start pleasing yourself, the church becomes divided and ununified. As Christians, we are dead. We're not dying, okay? We are already dead in Christ. You know what happens? We just want to come out of the grave right now. Every few moments, we're digging ourselves out of the grave. I hate being dead in Christ. I want to live for myself, and that's our flesh. Understand, Christians are to live as dead people. Every aspect of our life is to reveal, I am no longer living for myself. I no longer please myself. That's why I got married. Marriage is the death to self. Think about this. Wives, submit to your husband. You must die. You die to your husband, and you die to yourself, and so you serve your husband. You die to yourself, to your kids, you serve your children. You literally have no more self left to serve. You're, especially when you have more kids, you're just spread out. And everybody starts complaining, I'm spread out so thin. I feel like I'm going to what? Die? Without realizing that they've already what? Died. You guys see what I'm saying? You get confused. As a Christian, you are dead in Christ, right? Why do you act as if you're still what? Alive and significant and still think, I need to minister to myself. Husbands, it says, love your wife. You're like, yes. it doesn't say die to ourselves. And then it says, just as Christ, what? Died. So wives have to die to themselves by submitting to the husbands. Husbands have to die to themselves just like Christ died for the church and serve his wife. So a wife is dead, she serves her husband. A husband is dead, he serves his wife, meaning the husband must always look for 
the benefit of his wife first, not what benefits him. And then having children accelerates the continual death aspect. It just like shoots up. You gotta die. You can't sleep. I wanted to sleep last night. And then Micah wakes up. Water! Water! You're screaming water and I'm bringing you water. I'm, I'm serving my little baby. Who's the master here right now? He is. And I give it to him. He goes, Thank that. And he goes back to sleep. And then now I can't sleep. And I have to get, go into that motion. And then I woke up again and again. You're, and then when the baby's born, that's literally when you're a walking zombie. And then children are taught to be dead to themselves by submitting to parents. See that? As they're growing and become, they want to become Christians, but you're teaching them already before they would die with Christ that they need to live a lifestyle of death. And then becoming a member of the church, you're dying to, your, your whole family now dies and, and, and takes on the mission of the church. There's no, oh, my family comes first anymore. I, I, that's not correct. When people say, well, church is here, this is my family. Whoa, 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 whoa. Joining the member of the church means our whole family now is going to die to our family life and be one with the family of God. Everything's about dying. Again, look at verse 2. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his building up, for even Christ did not please himself. And that's the point. Christ died. He did not live for himself. He died for us. So you know what we have to do? We have to live for others. Okay? We die to whatever we want to be like and so we start living for those whom Christ died for. You know, many of us have no clue how to do this. You guys have to understand this, okay? Don't pat yourself on the back yet because you need to understand, growing up in America, you have been conditioned to always think about yourself first. It's in you. You are so selfish. Okay? We're so ingrained with this idea that we have to look out for ourselves first, our family first, that thinking about others first is literally a foreign concept. It's always, oh yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that, but let me see how it's going to affect our family. Oh, we'll do that if it benefits our family. Oh, retreat? Oh, let me see if it's going to affect our family and benefit our family because if it doesn't, we're not going. And then we have to advertise that, oh, it's really good for your family. And then, oh, it's good for us? Then we'll what? Go. Instead of saying, oh, there's a retreat? How can we go and serve? How can we, how, how can we be there for others? Oh, I don't like camping, but if the church is going, I'm going to go and serve. I'm going to go and please them. Do you guys see? This is how we're supposed to think. But we don't think that way. We're told we need our downtime. We're told we need our, our binging time. You know, watch one whole season in three hours so we can fill ourselves with just relaxation and whatnot. Rather, we to find the relaxation in serving. Husband, husbands putting the needs of their wife first. Wives putting the needs of the husbands first. Parents doing what's best for their children rather than causing their children to fit their expectations. Families putting the mission of the Christ first to make disciples. So here, here's, the, here's the example I want you to kind of picture, okay? You're a dad, all of you. Just imagine you're all dads. You come home after a long day of work, of, of your boss's criticism, and something doesn't go out right, and, and you're sitting at the desk, your neck's hurting from the screen time, and, and your back's aching from the drive. You just sat an hour and a half in four or five traffic or the five freeway, and you just want to get home and make sure 
man, when I open the door, it better be clean, nice, cool, air conditioned, turned on, and my dinner better be hot. Now, instead of doing that, you drive in and you are now excited. I get to serve my family. What does she need? What does my son and my daughter need? I need to pray with them. I need to ask them, are you okay? Give them a hug. And you just give yourself because Christ gave himself for you. The joy of dying on the cross was in his heart. And so now you need to find that joy in your heart and go get out of your car, walk through that door and be that Christ to them. And serve. And when you can't stand because you just are so tired and you just knock out, then you can sleep. Just clunk out. You know, when, um, when I get afraid when guys get, graduate college and they land these like, you know, six-figure jobs, you know, the first thing on my mind is, oh, I hope they don't use all that money to buy whatever they want to please themselves. Every, it's, it's a natural thing. You start having money, you want to buy things. Nice things for yourself. And I want to encourage you, use all that God has given to you, okay? And find the joy of giving yourself out more than you can possibly feel like giving. And every time you feel like you're going to just die and get so tired, you think of Christ who died who tirelessly dragged that cross to the point and got, got, and got, was lifted up and he drained the whole, you know, it's just, he was drained down to nothing for your sake. And at the last moment, he would even say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they what. They do. That's insane. That at the end of your life, you would have enough you know, consciousness to know that what you're doing is serving God and everyone else deserves to die, but you will say, God, forgive them. You know, had Jesus not prayed that prayer, there will be no one left. So when we talk about drinking or something that you want to do, the real question is, are you trying to please yourself or are you willing to die to yourself or be dead in terms of being already dead in Christ and start living for the sake of, a, of the other what of the other person now that's what Romans 14 is all about now turn with me to 1 Timothy 3 now that we established the attitude of our hearts okay and I'm sure all of you are saying yes Give it to me. I want to die. Today, that's it. I'm going to die. Live for others. Help me, God. Okay, that's the right attitude. Now, let's take a look. Now, last week, we asked three questions. Is alcohol a sin? No. But can Christians drink? Yes. Should a Christian drink? And usually, the answer will be what? No. I was talking with Jacob last week. Or oh, I forgot. who Was it you? Like, if we were in Russia somewhere... You know, and we were like doing some mission work there. And the family said, sorry, comrade. The only thing we have right now is household vodka. <laughs> no. And we'll be like, oh, can we dilute it with the water? So sure, you weakling. But, you know, if that's all they had and that's all they serve, I can even show you a text in the scripture that says, if they serve that, just eat it without, you know, raising a conscience. Now, if somebody in our church was really conscious struck, then I would actually, what, withhold. So there will be instances where that might be appropriate. But usually, at least in America, we have clean water everywhere, okay? Some of you drink tap water, which I think is gross, but you're okay, alive and well. So yes, you don't need to put alcohol in there, okay? It's gross. I gotta say it again, it is so gross. Just look at the microscope under the microscope. It is so bad. If you're alive, it is by God's wonderful grace that you're alive, okay? I don't, don't worry, I'm not talking about a particular person. It's, yes, there is a... <laughs> Culligan! God gave us Culligan, okay? Or filter water. Anyways, so look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
Now, as I told you, we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at all the passages that talk about alcohol. And here's one of them. And this one's really, really interesting, okay? Uh, now, this is the qualifications of being an elder. But look at verse 3. One of the qualifications is he must not be addicted to what? Wine. Okay, there it is. He must not be addicted to wine. Now, the word addicted is not a good English word, okay? Because when I say addicted, what comes to your mind? Hmm? Like, like biologically, physiologically, like, I can't resist it, right? The word uh, in the Greek, par oinon, okay? Para and oinon is connected. Para means to be beside something. Oinon is wine. So paroinon means to be beside wine, okay? The nuance is someone who's known to always have wine next to him. It's not an indication he's, he's drinking and drunk or he's, you know, it's just when you know, when you mention this man's name, he's known to be a lover of those drinks. Okay? Um, he's a connoisseur or whatever. I mean, it could refer to actual addiction and where he's drunk. But for the leader, obviously, if he's drunk, he can't be a what? A leader. So what Paul is saying is, if you want to be a leader of the church, you better not be someone known to love alcohol. Can you imagine if just, you know, as a pastor, I'm like, hey, guys, did you guys see the new Bordeaux white wine they just made? 1685. I got one right here. Oh, I'm not going to drink it. It's just a collection. <laughs> You're like, dang, every time he talks, he's always talking about his wine collection. It's a wrong impression. Does that make sense? So Paul is saying uh, uh, an elder of the church must not be known to be beside wine. So the English phrase addicted to wine is, is not the appropriate way to look at this. The word addict, the proper English definition, uh, definition is this, physically and mentally dependent on a particular substance and unable to stop taking it without incurring adverse effects. Obviously, if there was, a, if there was someone like that, okay, let's say it was, uh, no, I'm just kidding. It was just some, somebody and he goes, I want to be an elder. Obviously, no one's going to be like, oh yeah, why don't you go, you know, study, go to seminary. So it's not talking about actual addiction, okay? MacArthur says this, it's someone who does not have a reputation as a drinker or involved himself in scenes associated with drinking. Clubs, nightclubs, bars. Oh, I remember one time, oh, this one student in seminary, I actually lived with him. He's like, I was like, where did you, I asked him, where'd you go? He goes, oh man, there's an Irish pub down the street. I actually went, I'm like, do you not know what the Bible says you're in seminary? Okay. Now, does this text forbid pastors from drinking? Again, the answer is what? No. But the implication is you better not be known for that. So obviously, Timothy, who knows this, decided not to what? Drink. In fact, he was uh, abstaining. He was abstinent. Now, look at chapter 4. Chapter 4. Again, every time, you know, there's a mention of alcohol or things that people think is sinful, Paul is very clear to say that thing in itself is not sin. Look at verse, um, verse 4. Or so coming from verse 3, he's talking about false teachers who forbid marriage, advocate abstaining from foods which God created to be shared in with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected for if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by word of God and what? And prayer. Meaning when a person thanks God for this particular thing, it's with a sincere gratitude to God for what he's provided. It's not, they're not parting with or taking advantage of it. Okay, whether it be a drug for your, your illnesses or pain medication, you say, Lord, thank you for, for morphine, you know, uh, for my grandpa who is in pain. 
and the doctor gives him that to relieve that pain as he's nearing the end of his life. So the Bible and Paul clearly demonstrates that everything God created is good, including grapes and other foods that can be fermented to make alcohol. All of those are good things. But despite all that, should a Christian drink, here Timothy knows what Paul has said. An elder must not be known to be a drinker. So what did Timothy naturally conclude? I will not what? Drink. So he abstained. Could Timothy drink? Yes. Did Timothy drink in the past? I believe so. Right? The Jews had that natural drink during weddings. Jesus also drank. And people love saying that Jesus drank. So I could drink at the, with the wine in Cana. He even did a miracle turning water into what? Into wine. So I believe Timothy understood that, that drinking itself was not wrong. But Timothy actually abstained. How do we know? Well, first of all, remember, he's a pastor in this church. People don't like him. They like Paul. They, oh, they were actually afraid of Paul. But they weren't afraid of Timothy. The false teachers went to slander his character. Since the false teachers said, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's sinful. Timothy decided, you know what? I'm not going to go near anything like that. So they have nothing bad to say toward what? About me. And so Timothy abstained. And Paul knew this, okay? Paul knew that he did, and he had stomach problems. He had an illness. Look at, look at verse 19, okay? Look at ch chapter 5, verse 19. And this is so interesting here, because Paul is now going to command Timothy to take some what? Alcohol. Look at verse 19. First of all, he tells everyone, because remember, Timothy's reading this to the public. Everyone knows Timothy is not a drinker. Paul is now going to say this out loud through Timothy as he's reading this. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three what? Witnesses. Now before that, he tells everyone, you should be paying Timothy well. The laborer is worthy of his wages. And then he tells everyone, don't accuse any elder unless there's two or three people who can accuse him that that, not accuse him, but validate that he's actually sinning. And then it says in verse 20, okay, those who continue to sin, reprove in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful. And then he says, verse 21, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his elect angels to observe these instructions without bias and do nothing in partiality. Now, this is huge. Paul, he's about to say to Timothy in verse 23, no longer drink water, but use a little what? wine but before he does that verse 21 he brings the whole heaven down on them the authority god jesus christ and even his what angels he tells the church what i'm going to tell you now do not fail to obey and then he says first of all do not lay hands upon anyone hastily thereby share responsibility for the sins of others keep yourself pure and then he says no longer drink water only. Now, when Timothy read that, everyone knew Paul is talking to Timothy. Does that make sense? Now, if you interpret this, it is really interesting, okay? First of all, okay, let me, let me finish reading this. Uh, no longer drink water only, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Okay, let's start there. His stomach and frequent ailments. What is this? Okay, the, the Greek, uh, nupnos, okay, it's saying it occurs in intervals. It's frequent. It's numerous. That this, this means it's a, it's a debilitating disease. It's been going on. It's, it's not getting better. And Paul knows it's because he's not drinking or putting wine into the water to to kill some of the germs that, that are there, okay? First, let's make some observations, okay? Number one, Paul could not heal Timothy. You guys get that? He did not have the power to heal anymore. In the book of Acts, people are literally laying on his shadow, or was that, or was that Peter's shadow, or taking handkerchiefs and, and touching his shoulder and running to the person and touching them and they're healed. Like it's, he had so much power now 
the power was taken away because there's no need to authenticate God's word anymore. So Timothy could not be healed by Paul, and Paul admits it here. Number two, Timothy's ailments were the results of drinking the dirty water at that time. Okay? There was no filter. Okay? There, was, there was no people who understood like microbacterial stuff in the water. Timothy was suffering some sort of debilitating stomach and all that caused through this illness because he just would not use wine in his drink. Now, it doesn't quite state exactly what the issue was, but here's some symptoms. If you just look online, now that we have our medicinal, medicinal information, if you drink bad water, it'll cause gastrointestinal problems, obviously diarrhea, and diarrhea is not good. Okay, it is bad. Uh, nausea, stomach cramping, dehydration due to diarrhea, dysentery. Okay, dysentery is in an infectious diarrhea, the inflammations of the intestines. You have bloody stool. It's caused by the Shigella bacteria or amoeba, often spread through contaminated food and water. Uh, you can have typhoid fever or enteric fever. This is the Salmonella bacteria in the water. Bacterial disease spread through contaminated food and water or close contact will cause high fever, headache, belly pain, constipation, diarrhea, and at the end, death. It's a very, very painful thing. Timothy was enduring all of this. Can you imagine his life? How uncomfortable it was. And she insisted because he wanted to be blameless. Uh, the Baker New Testament commentary says this, uh, and, I, and I quote, However, in the Orient, the water is often far from safe. Those who have been there, including, for example, those who were there while serving in the army, know this. If one insists on drinking nothing but water that's unboiled, a tax of dysentery may result. In fact, something worse might happen. So the Baker New Testament commentary says, Paul here is speaking of wine as a medicine, not as beverage. MacArthur says this, and I quote, In ancient times, most people consumed wine since it was the staple liquid to drink. The water was impure. Mixing the wine with water not only significantly diluted the alcohol content, but purified the water. A mixture of eight parts of water to one part wine was common so as to avoid any dissipating effects. So you can drink this without getting what? Drunk. I guess you can say it was a kombucha, right? A type of that, but, but more diluted. Timothy was reluctant, and I quote, uh, and I, I'm continuing to quote from MacArthur, Timothy was reluctant to take mixed wine so as not to set an example that could cause someone to stumble. Thus, he was committed to abstinence, and Paul had to tell him, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Drinking only water was contributing to his poor health, end quote. So, Timothy's illness, and observe this, is not due to sin. Okay? His illness was not due to sin, but to his commitment to remain blameless. But also consider this for a moment. Notice that God does not override your health because you want it to be godly. Sometimes we think, when I make this commitment to God, She's going to honor me. No. Like, I'm going to go on a mission trip to, you know, the jungles, and I know God's going to keep me healthy. Oh, no. Almost every missionary, missionary I know went bravely and came back super sick. I remember reading one man, Bruce Olson, Bruchko. He wrote a book called Bruchko, and he said, he said he had this tapeworm in his stomach and at one point he was so dehydrated he fainted he had this dream that he was pulling something out of his mouth and he was pulling out the tapeworm it was coming out it was like 20 feet long was, ah. and then he got up and said oh that was interesting the lord preserved me and he he went through a lot okay um the point that i'm trying to make is this you might do something in terms of commitment to God, but God doesn't show favoritism. 
What you sow, you will what? Reap. Let me give you some examples. Okay? Like eating certain junk food while doing ministry. Like, oh, I'm so busy doing the Lord's work. Oh, I don't have time to go home and cook. So I'm going to eat McDonald's, McDonald's. I remember one guy, he was eating Carl's Jr. every day for the Lord. And I warned him, you're going to get sick. And he just, he didn't think so, you know. Uh, later on, it was pretty obvious. He was getting a lot of like unnecessary weight and his back started to hurt and all because of Carl's Jr., okay. Also, he wasn't exercising, okay. Um, eating pork. Oh my goodness, this Wycliffe missionary went to this uh, these uh, natives and the natives had this issue of eating raw pork. Raw pork, it was their delicate delicacy. They would just cut pork and kind of warm it over fire and just chew on it. And the chief did this and she wanted to minister to the chief and he would not until she ate that food. And so she unwillingly took it, ate it, and then she just got ill. And what happened was she, um, the worm spread through her whole body. She came back to America. They gave her medicine. It caused the, uh, the, the, the worms to be dormant. And they couldn't, they couldn't rid of it. Rid, they couldn't get rid of the, the worm, so they told her, you need to just keep taking this medicine and just live with this worm. And I remember her, she was standing up there, she's saying, you know, if you cut my hand right now, you'll probably, you'll probably get infected, you know? And if I went to the cannibals, they probably won't eat me because they'll die from eating me. You know, she was kind of joking around about that. Her intention was good. She did it for the Lord. But guess what? You're going to suffer for it. But what's interesting was some good came out of that because she started to realize this is why everybody was dying so early. And he, she came back and told the chief, you have to stop. And she finally listened and they stopped eating raw pork. So some good came out of it, praise God, but you almost died. Okay? Or how about this? Not exercising while committing to your work, reasoning that you're doing it for family, you're being sacrificial, you know. Uh, or how about this? You pray, you have to pray on your knees. And so for one hour, you stand on your knees and then you realize you have knee problems. Now, I, I pray on my knees as long as I can, but once it starts getting uncomfortable, I just get up and sit down. Sometimes lay down or just, you know. Uh, it reminded me of my professor, godly man. He, he, he had two PhDs, one from Cambridge, one from Dallas Seminary. Always prayed three in the morning to five in the morning. Always. This guy was the type of guy where um, if, if you turn in your paper late, he will not give you any extension. He was very strict. Like, like there was a guy, he, uh, something like he had a baby. And he couldn't turn in his final paper to class. And the professor said, I can't accept that. You need to turn it on time. It's due tomorrow. And, and he's like, please, but I just had a baby or something like that. He goes, well, I'm, so, I'm sorry about that, but you need to understand. You need to get it done on time. Now it's not like that. Andy knows, you know, this guy's done. Can I have a week off? Oh, yeah. Can I have two weeks off to do, do this? His, his group is just not very committed. But you know what this professor did? He told the guy, I will not be lenient. And then he sent him home. And then the professor went to his house at night, knocked on the door, and he opened the door. He was shocked. Well, what are you doing here, professor? He goes, well, you did say that you have a manuscript. Oh, he said he had a manuscript, but his wife was, he didn't know how to type. So his wife would type it up for him. And so he said, I just need an extra day for my wife to just type it up for me. And he said, no. And so she went into his house and said, give me the paper, I'll type it up for you. And he stayed up all night typing. Can you imagine how embarrassed you would be, your professor doing that? And so you'll, you'll, you'll tell the professor, just give me a D plus, you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine the professor reading this like, this sucks, this paper is so bad. <laughs> it's like, uh, okay. But, so this professor, so committed, but she had so much neck pain. Because he would always pray like this. And he would study. 
like this. And eventually it got so bad, they would inject like, like medication in his back. And one time um, I saw him outside in the parking lot. I was working at the library. He was just like this. He's very old. It's like, you know. And so I ran out. I said, Professor Roscoe, what's, are you okay? He's like, oh, you know, Chi, I, I just want to just thank God right now. You know, he's showing me that I, I, I need him. You know, I'm praying and it's, it's hurting. Yes, I have some shots, but it's not working. But and he kept saying, but I praise God. I praise God for this. And I'm like, stop. Just stop. You know, like, like what can I do for you? He's like, oh, just. So I ran in and got some ice. And he goes, oh, gee, that's so kind of you. I, I didn't ask for that, but you, man, you are such a servant of God. And he was like, you know, can I pray for you right now? You know, can I pray for you? And I was like, no, stop. You don't have to do this. He goes, no, let me pray for you. And he was just like squirming. And he's like, you know, Chi, do you have a, do you have a lady in your life, Chi? Do you have a, I was like, we don't need to talk about who I like. But there's this one guy that I like. <laughs> but we don't have to talk about her, but her name is da 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 you know. This is way before I met uh, Pauline. And, and so, I wish it was Pauline, okay? But I didn't know she existed. And so, and so he, starts, he, starts, he starts praying for her. Her name. It just goes on and on. And he's just like in pain. I'm like, I feel so, I was like, well, I'm, what am I? I feel so dumb. Like, why did I do this? I should not. And then next week, you know, she went out with me. And I told her, I said, your answer, your prayer was answered, Professor. Anyways, the point that I'm trying to make is as godly as he was, he suffered. He suffered. How about going to church 5 a.m. to pray because it's so spiritual? What's the result? You're going to be tired the whole day for work. Oh, how about this? You make a vow not to date until a certain age. I made that until after college. I think that's actually a pretty good thing too. But, and then you end up being single for another 35 years when you could have met someone that, that year. Or lastly, committing to an organization that's not doctrinally sound, but they're very spiritual, visionary, and you think that the Lord's going to provide because you committed to that spiritual work and then you end up not having a job or money the conclusion is this if it's not in line with God's word and you make a commitment while it's a good thing you're going to suffer for it like I don't think my professor should have he should have watched out for his neck okay um, I don't think people should make vows like that of not dating until a certain time. It's not in the scripture. Okay? And here, Timothy made this commitment with good intentions. But at that time, it was harmful. And so, you know what Paul does? He overrides Timothy's promise to God by issuing a biblical command. Did you guys notice that? And only the scripture can vow, annul whatever vow you actually what, make. If you break your vow, you're going to incur judgment. And you should repent from that. But here, he commands him. And that's the only time you can really get out of it. And so you don't want to make foolish commitments. Okay? So because you will pay for it, because God does not show favoritism, how you live, you're going to reap the consequences of that. So Paul tells Timothy, no longer drink water only. But, and I want to end with this, the King James Version wins the title for best translation because all the translation says something like this. ESV says, no longer only drink water. Uh, the NASB says, no longer drink water exclusively. The NIV says, stop drinking only water. The, the literal translation is, drink no longer water. That's literally word for word. And Paul is literally telling Timothy, no more water for you. That's it. Like, I command you, you shall not drink water ever. Like, it's that kind of a command. And everyone's listening to this. And now they know if Timothy's going to drink this, they cannot say anything what? About it. Okay? Now he says, use a little wine. Meaning, for that situation, for that service, for that medicinal purpose, so do that. Now we'll pick it up next week because we, we're out of time. But it's fascinating to understand it in this perspective. Okay? 
So when you ask me, Pastor Chi, does the Bible say we can drink or not? Uh, my answer to you is it's not a simple what answer. Why? You have to be wise with the scripture. You can't just be like black and white, yes, no. You have to understand what's going on. And next week we'll clarify more why what Timothy did was a good thing, okay? But at that time it was foolish. But for us today, do we need to do we need to clean water with alcohol? And the answer is obviously what? No. Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what we have learned. Also, the testimonies of these great professors and, and the testimony of Tim, Timothy. And we, Father, we've learned so much. We ask for wisdom to process all of these things and to apply it in the right way. Father, help us to live according to your will, knowing that what we sow, we will ultimately reap. And help us to sow righteousness and wisdom that we might reap uh, the blessings of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.